Good evening everyone, my name is Helen Parr and I work for Devon Wildlife Trust on the Green Mines project in Plymouth. So Devon Wildlife Trust are a partner on this exciting Plymouth City Council-led project. It's funded by the European Regional Development Fund's Urban Innovative Actions Fund, it's a bit of a mouthful, uh, and it run, it's running for three years and it finishes in August 2023. There's a fantastic opportunity for Devon Wildlife Trust to bring our experience and enthusiasm for wildlife and nature to the green and the blue spaces uh, of a large city like Plymouth. And it's about making space for nature while helping local people reconnect with the natural world, getting all the physical and mental health benefits that we know that this can bring. So it's a win-win situation, really. And um, you can find out more about other events like this, in-person events, as well as online talks on the greenmindsplymouth.com website. Uh, and you can also find out lots of other things at the other, there's six other partners on the project, so you can find out more about what, what they're doing as well. So on to tonight's talk. Uh, tonight we're going to learn all about the incredible marine life of our beautiful coast around Plymouth. And our speaker tonight is Paul Naylor. Paul is a Devon-based marine biologist and underwater photographer with a passion for showing people what beautiful and fascinating animals live around the British coast through articles, talks, films, social media and TV, as well as uh, his book, Great British Marine Animals. Um, and Paul's not content with all that. He's also, appeared, his footage has appeared on, on the BBC's One Show, on Blue Planet UK, Country File and Autumn Watch. What, what, a, what a CV. And so, and Paul is a great supporter of Devon Wildlife Trust uh, and really helps us to raise the profile of marine life and the importance of caring for the ocean. So. Thank you very much, Paul, and over to you. Thanks very much. And I'll just admit that person. Yeah, I'll, sure. I can admit people now. Okay. Yeah, don't worry about that. Screen optimised for video. <laughs> Share. Right, does that all look? Yeah, that all looks great. So I'll, I'll mute myself now and I'll, I'll let you crack on. <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Helen, and, and thank you everyone for attending tonight and um, coming in out of the warm. Um, so I'm going to talk about Plymouth, uh, pardon the pun in this Plymouth sounds amazing, but I'm going to talk about the amazing marine life that's right on our doorstep. And it really is truly astounding you know this picture was taken in in Plymouth Sound it shows a whole diversity of marine life and if you if you tell people what's there right you know just close to the hoe they are often really staggered people come up to you if you're changing to go diving or snorkeling sometimes and say what have you just been seeing and and if you say um what you've seen sometimes they look at you and think what's he got in his air tank you know um this is amazing that this is there and, and what's brilliant now is actually on social media quite often now I say oh if you're on still while I'm dripping if you're on Instagram you can go and see uh, see pictures that I, I've taken recently you know a lot a lot of Plymouth and they can see it straight away and when they just see the colourful pictures come up they are they are am amazed by them so and quite often I like to start talks with um, oh now Oh, sorry about this. Ah, okay. Um, with some colourful pictures and say, you know, where are they, where are these taken? And they are all taken, all these colourful animals, all those photographs. It's not animals like that that live, it's actually all those photographs were actually taken here, basically inside Plymouth Sound. So I'm really going to concentrate on animals that, that we get living locally and hopefully as well not just say you know show that they're colorful in the visual sense but really introduce you to the the lives of them and some of their intriguing habits and show why they're i think they're real characters and i'm going to start with a couple of characters here um i'm sure a lot of you recognize this this is um the pool at firestone bay some devil's point eastern kings whatever you call it. it looks rather tropical there and i want to just look at two animals that live there and these are photographs actually taken just on the wall by that pool so they aren't sort of um, great diving depths they're just there and they are i'll we'll come back to them later but here we have some sort of perhaps rather unprepossessing um little snails called dog whelks and they're feeding on the barnacles there on the wall of the pool and there's a whole sort of life story going on there 
And also in a, in a little hole on that same wall lives this guy. And it is a guy, this is a Montague's Blenny, and this is a male with his rather proud head crest there, showing he's a male, and he's there guarding eggs laid by the females. And that is right there where that, where that yellow arrow you saw on that, on that picture was. So they are right there on audible set. And of course, one of the things I really want to get over is that you don't need, you know, to put on, uh, you know, extensive diving gear and be diving out near the breakwater to see these animals. They're everywhere. Um, and you can see them snorkeling. This is an example of um, some snorkeling in a bio blitz. You can see Royal William Yard in the background there. And again, it's nice to have a wetsuit and fins to get you around, but really you can see a lot just with a mask, snorkel and some swimmers. That's the sort of basic kit. And if you don't even want to get wet at low tide, you, know, you can find follow the seashore code and look around under stones and so on and amongst the rocks. And you will find some of these some of these amazing animals. So it really isn't just a sort of uh, something for divers to to appreciate. Okay. And one of the first animals that, I want to get over that, that people tend to think, well, it doesn't do very much, is a barnacle. You see these sort of what look like white studs on the rocks. And I've even had people saying, I didn't know they were animals. I just thought they were a, a thing. But what gives them away is this wonderful feeding hand that sticks out of the top of the shell the house made up of little plates because they're actually not a mollusk they're a crustacean so if you think of a shrimp that's stuck cemented itself um, to the rock by its head turned its armor into a little plated house and waves its feet out of the roof to catch food that's a barnacle and sometimes if you go up to a pool or somewhere lots of barnacles you might be lucky enough to see a scene like this lots of the little feeding hands sticking, sweeping out for food. And, um, oh, by the way, I think that was probably my most popular ever post on Instagram was that little video, more than sort of colorful fish and, and mesmerizing kettlefish and so on was barnacles because people just found it so surprising that they were doing that. Now you might think, why don't I see them doing that? Because as soon as I go near a pool, somewhere all the little hands come in, as soon as your shadow goes across the barnacles, it comes in. They, they, they draw them in. And why they're so shy is partly because of this chap that we talked about earlier, the Montague's Blenny. They actually live on the feeding hands of the barnacles. So they sit on these barnacle covered rocks. When the hands stick out, they try to bite them off. And that's their, their diet. So you can understand why barnacles are rather shy. Can I just check, Helen, that everything's working, the video and the sound? Yeah, all good. Thanks, Paul. Brilliant. Thanks, Helen. OK, another another character, if you like. I'm sure when you've looked in pools, you'll see these little red anemones and they look like on the left, a rather sad little wine gum stuck to the rock. When the tide's out, when the tide's in, you can appreciate their lovely crown of tentacles. Um, they sort of take a totally different beast. Um, and those tentacles are covered with thousands of miniature harpoons coiled up in little stinging cells. And when something like a, 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 a small shrimp brushes against those tent tentacles, the harpoons shoot out and they can inject poison. They, they don't do any harm to us. They're, they're not powerful enough for that. But for a little shrimp, they can stick to the shrimp, pull it into the mouth, or they can inject a poison, paralyze it. And that's what they live on. So people might know that. But what is perhaps more surprising is the role of these blue, if the pointer works, these blue beads round the middle of the anemone and they are um, why well, it's called a beetle anemone and they are actually used in fighting um, with other anemones because you can imagine if your lifestyle depends on um, ambushing prey you know prey just bumping into you there are some spots that are much better than others so if you want to take over another anemone spot you might sidle up to it and you bring your blue beads to bear on it and the other enemy do, does the same and they both fire off Sting cells, even more of them in the blue beads at each other. The weaker one sort of shrinks away, sidles away. The, the winner takes over that spot on the rock to catch food. And sometimes if you see um, beetle enemies with um, the, the blue beads like these very greatly expanded, it's because they're getting ready for a fight. In this case, it's the, it's the red one with the green one. OK, another. And just just those are on the shore, but another beautiful anemone 
um, that we see in Plymouth Sound, and that shot was taken in Plymouth Sound, the tall white one, is, a, is a, called a plumose anemone. And um, on the right is just a shot showing one extended and the orange mound that you get when they're retracted. And, and obviously they look very different, but when they extend to feed, you see that lovely crown. And intriguing thing about um, plumose anemones, like a lot of sea anemones, they don't just reproduce sexually like all animals, they can also reproduce asexually, like they budding and they can just bud bits off themselves. And if you look at this group of plumos and enemies and see the little white ones there at the bottom, they've probably just broken off the base. So what you get is a whole load of anemones on a rock face that are all clones of each other. They've got the same, you know, genetic makeup and lots of them. But what's intriguing apparently is when a plume as an enemy is next to another one, it will automatically lash out with a with a special fighting tentacle at the other enemy, unless the other enemy is a member of the opposite sex that it sort of wants to get friendly with, or it's a clone mate, i.e. a direct relative. So if it's not a if it's not a relative or an opposite sex, it wants to fight with it. And I think that's yeah, rather rather intriguing uh, behaviour. Okay, another. Um, sea anemone you get is the stake locks. These are small green, um, well, I say these are, are, are very small, bright green ones. They have a bright green colour because of the algae that lives in the tissue symbiotically. But big ones get up to dinner plate size uh, on the rocks. I don't know if anyone remembers, many years ago there was a headline in the, in the Herald, I think, saying sea anemones eat sharks. And it was at the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth, which of course we're very lucky to have. And I think they were losing some of their baby cat sharks, so tiny little cat sharks, just a couple of inches long, were coming out and they were, they were going missing in the night, never to turn up again. And they found they were being eaten by these large snake locks and enemies. They blunder into the tentacles in the dark, perhaps, and not orientated as they'd only just hatched. And they were getting snaffled by the enemies. And that was the basis of that, that headline. But these snake locks and enemies might be able to eat little sharks, but they're no match for these guys. These are three grey sea slugs you can see on the left, crawling up to the, these snake locks and enemies, and they will obliterate them. The, the, the grey sea slug will eat the lot. You can see one in the process of doing it. This one down at the bottom, it's eaten all the tentacles. It's going to eat the base now. So most animals won't eat sea anemones because those stinging cells that catch prey are also good defence. But the sea slug doesn't mind. But not only does it not mind, it actually manages to ingest the stinging cells, sort of wrap them in a mucus, pass them through to these undischarged, untriggered, to these little white frills on its back, where they sit in sacks at the end. And when something comes and tries to eat the sea slug like a fish, it gets a face full of secondhand stinging cells, secondhand weapons, which I just think is amazing how that evolved, that use of the sea anemone weapons. And sometimes when you give sort of talks to school kids, you can say, um, you know, does anyone eat wasps? Of course, you can't eat wasps. You know what would happen? You get stung in the mouth. But imagine if you could eat wasps and end up with a wasp sting in your skin. And if someone tried to grab you, they'd get stung by the wasp skin. You know, what a superpower that would be. And that's what these sea slugs are doing. Now sea slugs are very interesting um, or, or nudibranchs, some, uh, a, a group of them, a subgroup of them are referred to, very interesting and you might be intrigued to know that Plymouth Sound is a real hot spot for nudibranchs in the UK. Um, a lot of people, you know, a lot of divers get very passionate about these tiny colourful animals and Plymouth Sound is one of the hot spots um, and all those three exotic, they're very small those three sea slugs but they're all all those shots were taken in Plymouth Sound. And why it is, because the when the tide rushes in through the sunken river valley that makes up the, the shipping channel through Plymouth Sound, it brings in lots of plankton food. And there are lots of animals like sponges and hydroids, um, static animals that feed on this plankton and the sea slugs prey on those animals. So the whole of Plymouth Sound is a, is a sort of massive smorgasbord for, um, for, for, for sea slugs. And that's why it's such a, uh, such a popular spot for them. Okay. Right, so everyone knows sea slugs are colorful and, and interesting, but limpets, perhaps they're a bit more 
you know, humdrum, people see them clamped to the rocks, think they do, don't do anything, but they do, very fascinating animals. And one of the things they do is they wander around at high tide when the, the sea covers them and they graze on the rocks. Um, they graze algae on the rocks. And you only need to look at pictures from somewhere like that was badly affected by the Torrey Canyon oil spill. The people who might remember that where the limpets were killed off more by the detergents than the, than the oil. But you see these beaches just choked with seaweed, um, totally inaccessible because the limpets weren't there to graze. And they, um, but they, when they go off to graze, they come home to a home scar on the rocks. And these circles on the rocks here, and even clearer here, are the home scars of limpets where they've um, ground their shell against the rock to make a perfect fit on the rock so they can keep the water inside them at low tide and um, they get back there and they navigate by laying out mainly they have backup methods but they mainly navigate back to the home scar by leaving a little trail of slime across the rocks and you might think oh but when all the trails cross how do they know which is their trail well, they've thought of that there's a chemical signal individual chemical signal to them in the trail so they can follow their own but there are other you know even if um Victorian scientists had a fraction for this and tried scrubbing away the slime and the limpets still got home. And if you turn the rock round so they can't navigate by the side, they still got home and so on. And, and there's some sort of um, memory involved um, of, um, you know, they can remember the topography. So it's fascinating with limpets thinking, oh, yeah, sort of turn right at the bit of seaweed and I'll get home. So, uh, yeah, uh, very uh, underestimated animals. And the other thing about limpets is occasionally you might see them what looks like fighting um, with one limpet trying to jam its shell under the other. Now, the literature like these two are here. Now, the literature tends to suggest that's the, uh, sort of dispute over grazing rights. But when I showed quite a few of these pictures to a limpet expert, he said, look how many of the limpets that are fighting have this luxuriant seaweed on their shell. Um, and he thought that one was simply trying to crawl up onto the other's shell to graze this seaweed that looks much tastier than sort of rather meager offerings on the rocks. And um, the other one doesn't like it and is trying to get rid of it. And you think, well, it can't feed on its own seaweed. So why is it trying to stop its mate doing so? Isn't that rather selfish? Or, but what it is, is that the limpet has uh, instinctive great dislike of another snail-like animal crawling up onto it because it might be not another limpet after a free snack but a dog whelk like the one on the left that was the small sea snail we saw at the at the firestone pool there grazing on the limpets sorry preying on the limpets oh, sorry on the barnacles they don't just prey on barnacles they can eat limpets as well and they do that by drilling a hole and here we have uh, a, a washed up limpet shell with a hole, which is a telltale sign of dog whelk attack. It drills a hole, the dog whelk um, it might even take a couple of days to drill through a thick limpet shell, it sits there and drills. And eventually when it gets through, it pumps in um, a poison um, and an enzyme and an, 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 an uh, anaesthetic as well. Uh, the numbs that the kindly parasitizes the dog, the limpet, and then it turns it inside into soup and sucks it out. And that's why limpets, you can see, don't like a snail um, crawling up on their shell. But I do like this other limpet shell, which shows where dog whelks have started quite a few attacks. It did get through eventually, they did get through eventually, but the limpets managed to shake the, uh, the, the, the other attacking dog whelks off. Okay, so everything's still going okay, Helen, on the video and stuff? Yeah, all good. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and, and there we have um, a dog whelk preying on barnacles. And also you can see um, where you have mussels, you will see dog whelk, a dog whelk drill hole in mussels. And you might think of mussels as being defenceless against, um, against dog whelks, but they can actually throw out their byssus threads, which makes up sort of the beard when you eat them, um, what people call the beard. When you eat them. And if enough of those threads stick to the dog whelk and tight, when they tighten, they'll turn the dog whelk over and, um, and kill it. But of course, dog whelks 
have evolved not to prey on mussels in the middle of the, the mussel bed, but on the outside. So you don't find many dog whelks that are, that are, uh, that are affected like that. And just to say, I mean, these dog whelks that we started off at Farston Pool are fascinating animals, partly because they lay these egg capsules, you can see there, um, and those egg capsules hatch into miniature dog whelks rather than hatching into a larvae that drifts in the plankton. And what that means is you get local evolution and you get different shell shapes evolving on different shores. Um, um, so whether crab predation or storms are the main threat to the dog whelks depends on how big the opening is where the foot sticks out and so on so you get local populations and just the other thing to mention is that at one time dog whelks were very badly affected by tributyl tin which is used in anti-fouling paint on boats and that's now been uh, restricted um, banned for most uses and it meant in somewhere like Plymouth Sound where there was a lot of boats the dog whelks were really badly affected. And of course, because they're important predators, that had a, 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 a big impact on the ecosystem. Okay, our next animal is the shore crab. And of course, this will be familiar to everyone. And of course, this shows that, you know, we get shore crabs all around Plymouth, up some of the, the muddy creeks and so on in the Tamar estuary, they're even more common than they are in the sound. So this isn't just about the clearer waters of the sound. Uh, we get these amazing animals up up all parts of uh, you know around Western Plymouth and, and up the Plym too. And what dominates a crab's life is of course having to shed their armour because their skin doesn't stretch like ours as they grow, they actually have to take off their armour and when you see a pair of crabs like this, perhaps under a rock, you might think it looks like a pair of crabs but it's actually a crab that's just molted and that's its old suit of armour there that it's just climbed out of. And if we look at a crab that was kept in an aquarium, we see these are all its, well, this is about half its life. These are all armor suits off one crab called Craig um, when it was kept in an aquarium. And you can even see that when it's lost its right hand claw in a fight with a Blenny, it managed to regrow its claw, but cleverer than that, it regrew the, the new right hand claw as a smaller claw they normally have the right hand claw as the bigger claw and then it enlarged its left hand claw for the rest of its life. So Craig became a left hander after that. And the, um, the molt cycle where they shed their shell and then harden up again afterwards, very dangerous time when they first emerge from the old armour, very soft, but it's also important in the, in the mating um, in, in the reproductive life because female crabs are only receptive to mate just after they've molted their shell. And this is a male crab looking after, you'll, you'll find if you go crabbing, sometimes you'll pull up a pair of crabs and it's a male, if they're not actually mating and belly to belly, if the female's right way up like this, the male is um, guarding the female, waiting for her to molt. And you can tell from her color, her orange color, that she's uh, indeed coming up to molt rather than just molted. But another aspect, uh, if we go to another crab that we see a lot of in, in Plymouth Sound, and that's the spider crab, they see another aspect of molting. Um, spider crabs are big decorators. They deliberately decorate their shells um, with bits of seaweed and so on to give them camouflage. And after they molt their shell, they have to redecorate them. And this is a shot not actually from Plymouth Sound, this is up at Pabacum, but it shows what all spider crabs do. And this is after molting, they sit around redoing their hair. So they're all picking up little bits of seaweed and rubbing them on their shell until they stick. And this is then redoing their, their camouflage. And you'll see it's surprisingly, um, they're surprisingly dexterous with their claws, I think. And it's interesting that they can feel when the weed is stuck, the seaweed fragments are stuck because then they go on to the next one. So they're all there redoing their, their armor. Well, the camouflage on their armor. Okay, so I should move on. And just in case you're wondering what the seaweed sticks to, it isn't the big spines on the back of the spider crab, it's these miniature curved hooks that are around the spines that if you look at Velcro close up, 
actually looks just like Velcro. So it was the spider crab that invented Velcro. Another partnership, which, or another way of camouflaging, is done by these spider crabs. And these are really common in Plymouth Sound. They live um, amongst these snake locks and enemies often. There's some sort of relationship between the spider crab and the snake locks and enemies. And you can see these little blobs on the spider crab are where it's torn off pieces of sponge and attached them to its shell for camouflage. And the sponge grows and forms a complete coat. And these are two spider crabs, sort of these small uh, spider crabs, not the big spiny spider crab, living with a snake locks and enemy. And both of them have lovely smooth sponge coats, which is where the little blobs of sponge they've torn off have grown into a, into a coat. Um, just an, another partnership between a crab and an enemy is even closer. We, you know, those spider crabs live with snake locks and enemy. Are these two um, an enemy hermit crabs? This is again a pair. This shot was taken just off the waterfront in, uh, it, it, by the hoe there. And this shows this very aptly named cloak and enemy that lives on the hermit crab. It protects the hermit crab um, with its stinging cells and actually frees the hermit crab from needing to change shell. Um, because uh, change the mollusk shell it lives in because it grows a sort of hard porch on the uh, on the on the on the uh, front of the shell and obviously it benefits from bits of scraps of food from the hermit crab um, it gets carried around lots of interesting places and also people have observed hermit crabs actually deliberately feeding their an enemy giving it um, giving it bits of food okay now we're going to go on to another animal that doesn't need um, sort of to attach bits of seaweed or carry around an anemone for, for camouflage or defense. It does it all itself. And we sometimes see signs of them, you know, washed up on beaches in the sound. And this is, of course, a cuttle bone, the um, remnant of this amazing animal, the cuttlefish, which is actually related to creatures like the limpets, but it's sort of taken the body, basic body plan, turned that muscular foot into a sophisticated um, set of arms and tentacles it's got amazing vision um, it, it's very intelligent they're rated as sort of um, as intelligent as, as rats or, or kittens some people say and they've even shown in recent experiments that they have this um, ability to it's called by psychologists sort of withstand instant gratification in that they're intelligent enough to know for instance in a test that if they refuse that if they don't go for the first sweet when people do it with children you know and they'll get two later and they can do the same with prawns so they've sort of um they've got the that that the capacity that 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 people don't get you know for a few years into childhood they really are amazing animals and they are but perhaps they're most they're most famous for color change and i hope you can see that small cuttlefish nearly takes up the screen but it's matched the background perfectly with these stripes and so on and spots. And that photograph was taken again, right in front of the, of the waterfront restaurant down on the Hoe um, in, uh, uh, on, on a Plymouth Sound Bioblitz. And this is just to show another reaction that a cuttlefish does where it raises two of its arms and approach. It doesn't back off, it just raises two of its arms. And that is a signal um, divers sometimes joke, you know, that they're giving them the V sign, but it's actually called a flamboyant display and it's showing the pred potential predator, I've seen you, if you chase after me, I know you're there, you're just going to waste your effort because I know you're there, I might even, you know, bite you, it might even damage you, so just don't bother. That's a signal they send. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the, the fish um, uh, of Plymouth Sound. Obviously, the cuttlefish isn't a, a fish, it's a mollusk, but these are all the fish. And one of my favourite sort of composite pictures is these, because it shows all these photographs were actually taken in the Plymouth and Sound and Estuaries special area of conservation. And I hope it shows just the sheer sort of diversity of fish life that, that we have. And some of these characters will be appearing soon. Okay, let's get my moving. Now I'm going to go back to blennies now. Now we saw the Montague's blenny with the, the, the single quiff at the, um, at the Firestone pool there in its hole. 
The so-called common blenny, or more often called uh, a shanny on the left, is very much the most common blenny in pools. So nine times out of 10, if you look in a rock pool and see a little greeny brown fish dart away, that will be a, a shanny or a common blenny. And then we have the tompot blenny, which is also very common in, in Plymouth Sound, but it tends to live just a little bit further from the shore. You might see it in pools on very low tides, but generally it lives just below um, the shore and you need to snorkel or dive and shine your uh, torch into the crevices. And there you will see the tompot blenny with this very fine pair of red hen head tentacles that are ultra distinctive. And just a little bit about the, the basic life of a blenny. This is common to all the, all the blennies, but this is a tompot blenny at the top. He, he will guard his crevice fiercely, even against animals like velvet swimming crabs that people think are very feisty, you know, with their red eyes they'll, and they'll nip you. But you wait until you see one confronted by a tompot blenny that wants it out of its territory. There's no match. So it's a male that guards the territory um, and he he then invites females in. This is a female that he's snuggling up to here as she lays her eggs. She will lay eggs with several different males. Males will invite several different females in. It's sort of quite an uh, uh, easygoing society both ways. But even though each uh, uh, male and female will mate with multiple partners, it, it, they are choosy about who they mate with. And that's why their, their social life is very complex. Anyway, the, the male then guards this raft of eggs laid by, that we can see here. If you look really close up, you can see it's made up of lots of tiny little dots. Um, and he will guard those eggs until they hatch into planktonic blennies. And by the way, that was one shot not taken in the wild. That was taken kindly at the National Marine Aquarium where they, um, they, they've got, they, they can raise um, blennies from, from, the, from the eggs. Okay. Now, what I find so fascinating about Tom Pop Blennies is that you can recognise individuals from their markings. And hopefully you can see a good place to observe the markings is close to a fixed point like the eye. And you can see all those Blennies at the top, very characteristic markings. And so when you take a close up photograph of one guarding his eggs in a crevice, that is a his, you know who it is, an individual. And on a patch of reef, this is this is actually um, out at Wembury Bay, but um, a state very common in Plymouth Sound. So on this small patch of reef, um, we've recognised lots of individual blennies over the last few years in, in this study we've been doing. Now, it sounds probably rather whimsical, um, identifying individual fish and, and giving them names and so on, which we do, as well as the numbers. For the scientific work, but the but the names sort of make them easier to uh, to identify with, and, and it's good, great for for engagement and so on. Um, but recognizing individual animal actually gives you studying animal behaviour a lot of, of power. It, it's really useful tool for science as well as just being uh, nice to do. And what it means, I, I, I could give a whole talk about the study, but just to mention some of the things we found by recognizing individuals and seeing how, for instance, Byron was in a fight with Benny there, um, but took over the territory later. Our star performer in keeping the same territory, which people find surprising for a small fish, was Bradley. Seven years, kept the same territory. And here we have um, a female as well that we've seen on the reef. Females are much more difficult to keep track of because they don't keep a fixed territory like the males, but she, Bathsheba was on the reef for seven years and Bobby was one of the uh, sneakers on the reef which is um, a new discovery about Tom Pot Blennies that like many animals um, some junior males act as sneaker males and they will try and enter a male's territory when there's a real female there they'll pretend to be another female and they'll fertilize some of the eggs that she's laid and this first came to light when we found what we thought was um, three female visitors with, with Byron, we thought he was being very successful, but one of these, what we thought was a female visitor, actually turned up as a, as a fully fledged male um, the following year. You might think, has it, has it changed sex? Like a lot of other fish do, but blennies aren't known to change sex, other blennies, but they are known to, uh, to, be, to be sneakers, other species, but not the tompot, 
until now. I'll just show you a video of, um, you can see Bertram there, he was a sneaker in 2017, and this is him in 2018, typical um, bourgeois male, which is the correct term, believe it or not, for a territory holder male. Um, and he's hosting a female there, encouraging her to lay her eggs. And this, uh, another video just shows typical Tom Pop Lenny behavior. They're small fish, but this is Brett, and he's right up to the camera. This was with a wide angle lens, and he's biting off bits of seaweed, spitting them out. And that's called a display of prowess. And he's doing that to show basically, look how tough I am. I'm not worried. You know, get your camera out of here. So uh, very, very territorial and amazing animals. And just a last bit about them. Um, when Teresa, my partner, did a children's book about the life of one of these blennies, she had the, one would say, rather crazy idea of taking one of the first books we printed down to show the real fish, Benny, and here he is coming out to look at his book. Uh, and that isn't a, uh, that isn't Photoshop, that really is the real Benny coming to look at a book that ended up rather soggy, but we thought it was worth losing a copy for that. Okay. Can I just check again? Um, Helen, everything's working? Yeah, all wonderful, thanks. Brilliant, thank you. And just to show, as I say, those a lot of those blennies were Wembury Bay, but they really are in the heart of Plymouth Sound as well. And here we have a Tom Pot blenny, again, looking out on the wonderful Plymouth Sound scenery. And this is, as I say, this is just out at, at Firestown Bay. And this is the sort of scenery you get that I said was so appealing to sea slugs because it's got this rich life because of the currents. And you can see here we've got dual anemones, sponges, different types of sponge, hydroids, and other creatures all to the current. And here's this top, this Blenny looking rather impressed by the, uh, the colour around him. Or oh, her, I think, probably, from the head tentacles, but that's another story. But just for the, um, for the fish aficionados, there's some, there've been some, apart from the common Blennies, some really interesting sightings in recent years. This is a variable Blenny, so-called, and this is basically a southern, species uh, mainly common from sort of France to Morocco but that has turned up this was in 2008 and was about the second photograph ever taken of a uh, variable blenny in Plymouth Sound but they're now common they now there is they live in Plymouth Sound they reproduce in Plymouth Sound this is one of the youngsters in amongst the typical sound sponges and this is a male um, almost black in colour guarding a guarding his his territory um, it's interesting that they they're very similar to the tom pop lenies they're smaller um, it looks as though the head tentacles have been caught in a bushfire um, but they seem to live in sort of narrower vertical crevices um, and they seem to coexist alongside the tom pop lenies but they're a new uh, a, a new addition to our to our marine life and presumably it could well be something to do with slight warming of the sea that's that's made it possible for them to colonize and this is another um recent um sighting this is a a, a, so a stevens goby we have lots of different gobies that's a, a, another type of fish a bit similar to blennies this is a, a common in the bottom left here a a black goby very common in plymouth sound they're not black unless they're they're breeding males but so black goby, but Stevens gobies were originally thought to be, a, a, or were previously thought to be quite a deep water sort of offshore species, but there's a colony right in Plymouth Sound and, 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 and breeding as well. So that's a very interesting sort of recent discovery. So it really is a rich uh, fauna. And this is a, a, another Stevens goby that I suspected might be a gravid female with lots of eggs from the size of her belly. No, she might just have had a hefty meal or he. And, um, but I wanted to show this just again because of all the jewel anemones and sponges, very characteristic of, uh, of Plymouth Sound. And I don't know if you've um, noticed, but, but um, that, well, no, because I haven't said about the gobies, but those blennies, remember it's the males that um, do, the, do the egg rearing. And this is quite a common feature and shallow water fish and this is a greater pipe fish in Plymouth Sound and actually you can tell it's in the heart of the sound because this is one of the cables that crosses the sound and seahorses are like pipe fish in that the female lays her eggs into a pouch on the, on the male's belly and the male then rears them and, and gives birth effectively to, to miniature pipe fish. So as I say this theme of 
um, of the male doing doing most of the the rearing carries on as well into the ras and this is one of my um, very favorite um, animals and really it's if you went snorkeling anywhere around Plymouth Sound one of the first fish you might see is one of these little corkwing wrasse now you probably see one of the drabber colored youngsters first but you might also see one of these very brightly colored ones and this is a male in his breeding colors and he's and he builds nests and this is a video people often don't think of fish as building nests but this is one of these corkwing wrasse building a nest and they don't just they use bits of seaweed uh, shaped into a, a sort of mass in a crevice and here he is picking up bits of weed ramming them in and they don't just um, use any old bits of seaweed it was pioneering work done by scientists actually at the marine biological association in plymouth jeff potts back in the 70s that showed they pick select different types of seaweed for different parts of the nest crusty bits of weed for the outside that actually continue to grow and knit the outside of the nest together, softer bits for the females to come and lay their eggs. And here he is dragging a big bit back. And one of the reasons I like this video actually is because when we showed it at a uh, at one sort of wildlife event, someone complained that we were showing tropical fish video at an event that should be about local wildlife. And then I said, no, nope, this is taken at a beach just down the road. They were absolutely astounded. And so that's the male corking wrasse. And this one has built his nest in very shallow water, but sometimes they actually build their nest above um, low water mark. So they have to only visit them at high tide to do the building work. And it's not a mistake, they just get less animals like crabs um, uh, attacking the nest, but they get more, you know, it's a trade off. There's more danger from, from sort of desiccation and so on. You can see it's it's Wembury here. That's the new stone in the background. And this is the nest. That pink weed has been bleached. So it's rather difficult to make out. But that's one of these nests. But they offset the desiccation risk by always building them in crevices that face north out of the sun so they don't dry out as much. And just to add to the complication for our hardworking nest builder, here he is with his mouth full of seaweed. These are all females, but are they? They are, they look just like females, they're drabber coloured and they have this blue egg laying propeller, which is a signal to the male that they're ready to lay eggs. But about nine out of 10 um, males are his color, unconscious nest builders, about one in 10 actually mimic females. So any of these supposed females could actually be a sneaker male that disguises himself and goes into a nest to fertilize some of the females eggs so um just it just there's so much complexity in these animals lives that we're finding out more all the time and do we have sharks in Plymouth Sound yes we do so apart from occasional visit to uh, of one of animals like basking sharks we have the small um cat sharks previously called um dogfish but cat shark you know is an accurate name because they really are sharks um uh, dogfish should be used sort of for deeper water animals really um, and they lay their eggs. Um, this is one attached to seaweed and um, wrapped around um, with the tendrils wrapped around a piece of seaweed to tie the egg on. Now, I'm not sure how many nurse how Oh, sorry, just say this. This is a, a shot. Again, you can see it's Plymouth Sound from the sponges. This is a group of four female um, cat sharks together. And these are uh, this is them refuging. This is where females bunch together for safety from the males because they keep apart from the males at all but mating time because the males are so aggressive. And um, this has been used in quite a few sort of shark textbooks, this shot and so on, because it's uh, Plymouth Sand has such good examples of these, of these small shark refuges. And just mention um, their bigger relative, the nurse hound, um, as I say, they probably get them in Plymouth Sound, though they're much more enigmatic and, and more difficult to, to, to see, slightly bigger. And I found by accident, this one again was out near Wembury, that when I took these close up photographs and looked at the eyes to, to check for whether it was this species or the small spotted capture, I accidentally discovered that the identical pattern was the same on both photographs. So it's actually the same individual nurse hound taken um, several months apart. So these animals are territorial. 
And just to mention a wonderful study being done out at Wembley Point by a guy called John Hepburn in combination with the Shark Trust, which is uh, looking at the this, this basically a nurse hound nursery where the nurse hounds come into shallow water and lay their eggs. And this patch has been known about for sort of a hundred years apparently. And you can see one of John's tags there. Um, on the eggs he follows you know how long they take to hatch and so on. when they lay them they actually lay them all year round they um, average about nine months to develop into a baby nurse hound that swims away so about the length of same time we take to develop and, um, and that's it so just coming to the end of the talk now some things I sort of promised I'd mention I said I mentioned corals um, well I talked about corals in the in, in the intro Blurb. We do have corals like these lovely dead man's fingers in Plymouth Sound, haven't covered them, haven't covered lots of the amazing habitats we have, but we do have seagrass, which is, as you probably know, a very special habitat, both in terms of biodiversity and um, sort of carbon capture and, and lots of stabilising the seabed, um, lots of seagrass in Plymouth Sound. Um, but above all, as I say, this wonderful diversity, and again, Tom Pot Blenny, but surrounded by sponges, a spiny starfish here. I haven't had time to mention all the starfish we have um, and all sorts of other creatures. So hopefully in future, when you see you know, a, a whole range of animals like this, you'll know that they were, uh, you know, you'll, you'll believe when you hear that they were all taken, all those shots were taken in, in, in Plymouth Sound. So I'll, I'll obviously be open to any, any questions. Just if I could end with a few plugs a big thank you to you all for listening um most importantly please support campaigns you know like the wildlife trust campaign for better protection for marine areas um just mentioned something we're um launched re recently or sort of pushing is the code of conduct for using um an area like Wembry and the, and the marine conservation area please look out for that if you'd like to see a film of of marine life sort of at Wembry and very relevant to, to In the Sound too. There's a there's a, a film called Wonderful Wembry on the Wembry Marine Centre YouTube channel that, that Teresa put together. Um, please, if you're interested, follow, I quite often post Plymouth Sound, but it's always UK Marine Life pictures on my Instagram. Please follow that and um, my book, Great British Marine Animals, the latest edition came out with a lot of behavioural stories last year. So just mention that. Um, I normally say more about the trust's work, but of course this is a I don't mind if I trust talk, so uh, you know, hopefully, quite a lot about that. So, okay, so I thank did on 45 minutes. Oh, thank you, Paul. That was absolutely brilliant. A bit of a I rush mean, through. I'll speak thought, for everyone else, but yeah, if you want to stop that. sharing your talk. Shall I stop now? sharing now? Yeah, great. Um, okay. And then, we, yeah, I mean, I, I just thought the incredible variety and those incredible pictures and you took all those pictures is that right yes, yes pretty much yes. which is amazing and I also loved all the little videos because and the stories and they it really brought it all to life and I loved the fact that there are sneaker males that's great absolutely isn't it? And, I, and I felt a bit sorry for the anemones when you call them sad little wine gums I thought well, they only look that. like that at low tide. <laughs> <laughs> I liked seeing them on the beach. I was looking for those. But, but they um, look, you um, see them in their true beauty yeah. at high tide. Um, so, yeah, if, if we've got um, a few minutes for some questions. So if you'd like to put anything in the chat uh, to me, then uh, we can uh, ask the questions. And also, if you've got feedback, if you enjoyed it or if you didn't, it's fine. You can tell us. We'd love to hear your feedback because a really important part of the Green Minds project is evaluating what we're doing. And we also, if you if you felt it was pitched just right or could it be longer or shorter or anything, then just let us know in the chat and that we'd be really grateful for that. Um, um, I'll also be, I will be doing um, a follow up email so I will put in a link to the recording but it will be on the Green Minds YouTube channel if you'd like to watch it again or uh, any people that booked on and didn't manage to make it they'll be able to watch it um, and you've plugged your book and I, I shall plug it again in the in the follow-up email um, so we have got a one question um, a couple of people said fantastic talk. Thank you. Someone's asked, do you get marine lichens? Ooh. 
you do but i'm not an expert i mean you do on certainly on the, on the intertidal area there are there are lichens yeah yeah okay. I, I think so anyway but please okay. don't i'm i'm very much a sort of <laughs> big watcher of big animals that i can see doing yeah things. so, so please, probably uh, yeah. a spot of googling might uh, on the internet might but, find but I, um, um, yeah um so another question is that um Nicola would love to know, have you seen any significant changes over the years to the marine environment in Plymouth Sound, for example, as a result of climate change and pollution, things like that? Um, it's a question I often get answered. I mean, you do see more of, of certain species arrive, which, which you think are probably related to, to, to sea warming. Um, and we get we get quite a lot of invasive species in Plymouth Sound, partly because of all the shipping movements. For instance, there's a sea squirt that's just an example of sea squirt that's endemic in Plymouth Sound now, and they think it came back from warships from the Korean War. You know, it started appearing then. So, and, and there are quite a lot of other animals like that. But what I would say also, um, because it's so difficult because I see different things at different times because I'm an individual. And, and so I'd really like just to plug things like um, Sea Search for Divers, uh, a recording scheme and Shore Search that the Wildlife Trusts are involved in. And there are lots of citizen science projects that collect sort of long term data and they are so powerful because they are just one individual because I sort of see different things when I go looking for them. So it can be really misleading. But when you get a proper recording scheme, with citizen science, you get really powerful data that, that can be used. So really like to give a plug for, you know, if you're interested in things like that, please look out for those things. Um, you know, that, and we're so lucky to have so much marine science going on in Plymouth. You know, there's the Marine Biological Association, Plymouth Marine Labs, um, Plymouth Marine Laboratory, the university, and, and they do, they're getting more and more involved with citizen science that people can join. So, so please look out for those. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and add a few of those bits and pieces onto the follow up email as well, because you're right, there's lots of stuff that, and that was one of my questions was, yeah, how can people, what can people do? And you've kind of answered that is they can get involved, you know, with some of these amazing projects. Got another question. Uh, and also, sorry, I was just going to say, hello. Well, so, and also just share, you know, if you know stuff about marine life, tell people because so many people don't think it's there. And if they don't think it's there, they won't care about the environment and so much. And once they Absolutely. know it's there, they just yeah. take a totally different view of, of, of things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Spread, spread the word, everybody. Yeah. As someone yeah. said, I, I wasn't sure, what was the name of the bay that you mentioned? Did you mention oh, a bay? Was it Firestone Bay? Firestone Bay, yes. Um, people call one. it different. It's the bay where that swimming pool was um, that I showed. It's by the Artillery Tower restaurant. It's sort of just just ho side of Devil's Point. Okay. And people call it different things. They even oh, call it Devil's Point. Well, it's not actually Devil's Point. Um, they call it Eastern Kings, Firestone Bay, and so on. But it's, yeah. it's by that pool. Oh, cool. And um, Oh, there's this, a question, um, and I know the World I Trust had a bit little campaign about this a few years ago. Are they taking wrasse out of the sound for salmon farms? Ah, no, that's a very good question. And it's interesting and it's good news because there has now been, I think it's this year and last year, there's been no fishery, certainly in, in the Devon waters. There's might be still some in Cornwall, um, but basically it was because the market, there wasn't, the market wasn't there, there wasn't a deal, you know, it, it's dependent on there being a deal, uh, uh, someone having a contract to transport the fish up to Scotland and that the, the market wasn't there for it. So mm -hmm. there was just no um, market for them, no fishing done. So obviously we're really yeah. pleased about, about and that. And for people who don't worried. know, could you just explain why the wrasse were being taken and taken? Sorry, yes, <laughs> the, the, because the wrasse are another one of the sort of behaviours that didn't have time. Wrasse are cleaner fish. They clean parasites off each other um, and off other fish as well, you know, non ras And so they were being used in salmon farms to clean the parasites off salmon. Now, it was sort of initially 
flagged as a, you know, isn't this great, rather than pour toxic chemicals into the sea locks, we're using a, a, a nature to do it. Mm -hmm. But of course, the rats have to be captured, they have to be taken live. And you might wonder why um, you know, rats from the West Country are being transported live all the way up to Scotland. It's because in Scotland, they've fished out rats from some areas in Scotland. And so there's all sorts of reasons why Devon Wildlife Trust and, and, and lots of the people concerned about this fishery, um, you know, the, the, the welfare of, of transporting sentient vertebrate animals all that distance. Um, they were killed, the rats were generally killed after one life cycle in the, uh, of salmon in the farm, so they didn't transfer parasites. It was stripping territorial fish that are very important to the ecology. So there was a campaign, say by Devon Wildlife Trust and to credit to them, the fishing authority did put restrictions on the fishery um, very quickly, which they hadn't done in Scotland, um, hence the problem in Scotland. But still, we were still delighted to see that for now anyway, touch wood, the fishery closing. Oh, thank you. And then Sorry, just as we head, to, <laughs> head towards seven o'clock in our end, there's just someone asking, this is quite a good question. I'd like to know the answer to this, and I'm, I'm, I'm worried it might be no. Do they do any glass bottomed boat trips around the sound? Do you know? No, that's not that I'm aware of. They, you know, they do in 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 other places um, around the UK and obviously abroad as well. That that be interesting. I mean, it's obviously very dependent on water clarity uh, and yeah. tides, but but we could do it. Uh, it could be done. Perhaps it's part of the National Marine Park. That would be a good way of spreading the word on. Yeah, it would be. Really nice. And I've just yeah. quickly got a few questions. You give a really quick answer. Are there seahorses in the seagrass? They have been seen, yes. Yeah, okay, that's good. Two but people asked that, so that's answered that. Are there any creatures we should avoid because they're dangerous to humans? I One that springs to mind to me is things like weaver fish and sea urchins. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. Our sea urchins generally here are, but but yes, if you if you're um, best to wear beach shoes on a, on a sandy beach in the summer because there could be weaver fish. Yeah, especially uh, on a hot day, I think at low tide is more risky. Sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and then, some jellyfish as well. Um, yeah. Look on some of the websites yeah. for which are the more yeah. Uh, yeah. nasty jellyfish stings. Okay, and how much do microplastics affect marine creatures? Um, and could we this suspect, lead to, yeah, go on. We suspect quite a lot um, in terms of concentrating toxin, but just to say some of the sort of world leading work on, on uh, microplastics is being done at Plymouth University by a guy called Richard Thompson and his team. I think I've got the mm, name right. Mm. Yeah, so they might have some information on that available yeah. if people are interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, and another thing which I had had as a question actually from um, Michael, um, do, is a human recreational activities having a negative effect? Um, so for example, disturbance to, to birds, but also maybe mean like from things like water borders, uh, you know, um, jet skis, kayaking and boats, like you mentioned, I suppose there's a balance, people are using the coast more and perhaps appreciating it more, but what's your view on that? Well, they, they can do. I think it, it's it's and those are great ways to be in, and enjoy the habit, the, the environment. But it, it's treating marine life with respect, you know, keeping clear where birds are nesting. So not disturb them, particularly with seals. Um, it's easy to get close to seals, but you can really disturb them, particularly well, all the time, really. And, and if you see there are some good um, available now, you'll see some posters up on how to treat seals with respect you know keep your distance um make sure they don't you know if once they start seeing you and moving away you've disturbed them and you could interrupt their lives they could even damage themselves on the rocks as they move away but there is quite a lot of information if you google um people like the cornwall seal team and wildlife trust you'll find some good advice on how to watch wildlife without uh, disturbing yeah. them. great oh that's great advice okay well thank you i think we'll, we'll end that because we've just run it slightly over but i mean i i could have uh, seen hundreds more pictures of your pictures and listened to you talking about it it was, it was brilliant so thank you so much um and we hope you've enjoyed that and as i say we'll do some follow-up and perhaps we'll see people at um some future events so i'm just gonna stop the recording now